Hello. So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Last day of the year. Um, Mark was going to teach today, but he had some conflicts. He couldn't be here. So I'm taking over, and I pulled a lesson I did out of the archives from August of 2021. So it's been a hot minute. If I get confused on my notes, don't hold it against me. Uh, but one of the things I did was I was taking a look at different, uh, like, kids' Bible stories that we hear and kind of diving into them and looking at the real account as to what actually kind of happened. And one of the really fun ones that I did, really interesting ones, was David and Goliath. And there's a whole lot in there than what we're fed as a five-year-old, right? You know, what we're fed as a five-year-old is um, uh, little kid, slingshot, big giant, underdog wins. Yay. Hurrah. Um, but it's a little bit different than that. So, can someone tell me just a brief overview as to what the whole David and Goliath altercation was about? Well, you just did. You just gave us one. That's pretty brief. Maybe, maybe not so brief. Oh. Well, the two major powers at play here were the Philistines mm -hmm. and the Israelites. Right. And um, actually also with David, you know, he was the youngest, didn't count that much in his family, was sent to go to the brothers and then took over. Right. We're getting there. <laughs> Don't get too far ahead. Um, so we know that Goliath was kind of the champion of the Philistine army. He was very cocky. He was very big. Um, one. So I started diving into the measurements of this guy and his armor and all that. So there's quite a bit of range kind of as to how tall this guy actually was. And so best I could find when I was digging through it was he was between just shy of eight feet tall and at his shortest and just shy of 11 and a half feet tall in modern day measurements. Um, either way, he was at least eight feet tall. Yes? It reminds me of the latest super tall basketball guy, the guy from France, I don't remember his name, but he towers over yeah. any other modern player that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. And if he were built like Shaquille O'Neal, then he might look kind of like a lot. Yeah, I would think so. And it's kind of interesting that you say that because I heard in a, in a, a historical class about this one time that uh, Goliath gets his name from the region of Gaul, and the region of Gaul is what's if I'm correct, uh, is modern day France and Gaul produced some really, really big people. Um, reminds me of a town in Iowa that produced these football players that were like six foot, 12 year olds. <coughs> but he's big either way. Um, so he, we kind of, we get a description in First Samuel where this is all found about, about him and he so it, it mentions um, he had a bronze helmet. Uh, there's not a weight specifically mentioned there, but we can kind of extrapolate that if it's bronze, which is already a very, very heavy metal, um, and he was a really big dude, that it probably was massive and more than any one of us could probably hold up for very long. Um, his coat of chainmail. Uh, his chainmail was described, uh, again, it's described in those unit of measures, um, but in modern day, it would be about 121 pounds of chainmail that this guy was dragging around. Yeah. Hang on, let me open up the same real quick. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, 
bronze armor on his leg, again, very big, very heavy, and a javelin or a spear, a javelin that he carried on his back. The spearhead, when the math works out to our modern day measurements, weighed 14 and a half pounds. Wow. Made out of bronze, right? Um, So then I kind of had some notes here as to um, just kind of thinking a little outside the box. Um, does anyone have like a metaphorical example of Goliath? Like a modern day Goliath? Well, the, the whole thing is basically a metaphor. It's really um, can be used in many ways. But yes. So uh, any large system of either government or uh, business or whatever that oppresses the weaker um, would be a good example. So you have right now a war going on in Ukraine from a superpower. You know, that, that would be one example, uh, even though Goliath's not doing very good on that one. Uh, Ukraine's holding their own, whatever, but that whole thing's a political mess. Mm -hmm. And you also have... Um, uh, like North Korea or China or whatever, you know, that are acting out against weaker. So, yes, if we go so, to yeah. the Goliath's region, then we have Hamas and Hezbollah. Hey, then, then the, mm -hmm. the greatest and the biggest and can do what I want, right? Right. And so, yeah, that kind of, was the Philistines. Kind of relevant to, to today, exactly. Yes, Jerry. It's it's to me it's a, a it's a fancy version of Revelation. God's going to win. Yes. And that I mean that's that's the whole to me that's David and Goliath. Mm -hmm. You've got uh, you've got you've got David with God on his side, and you've got Goliath with Satan on his side. And, you know, God is going to win, and that's the, that's what's constantly repeated throughout Revelation, is, is you may have this great evil beast, but God is going to win. Yes. And that, uh, and I think that just may have been part of the picture uh, that was to be Mm -hmm. was given to the Israelites and why Samuel repeated it. Right. To show that God was with David and was going to win. Agree. And uh, something that good, you just kind of sparked an idea. Um, is, is Revelation or, or, or David and Goliath, do, uh, do they just just barely win or skate by by the skin of their, their teeth? No, uh, they would. When, when they win, they win. They win with, big. With lots of lots of lots of strength. Yeah, or a kind of a one a one two knockout like uh, like, like David. Uh, it, 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 you know you you look you know David Goliath had been gone out daily taunting the taunting the Israelites and, and you know that's the way Satan has done it. Until it finally come up and and David smoked him. <laughs> yeah, he did. Linda, I saw your hand up. Well, according to Wikipedia and Babylonian tradition, mm -hmm. it says that David and Goliath were actually related. That Orpha was um, Goliath's mother and David's mother, no, David, uh, Goliath's mother was a daughter-in-law of, um, related to Ruth, it was a sister-in-law of Ruth, his mother. Huh. I hadn't heard that. Yeah. And that's why David said to him, hear, the, hear this word before you die. Were not the two women from whom you and I were born sisters? And your mother was Orpah and my mother was Ruth. That was tradition. That's not in scripture, right? Yeah. Huh. I, I, well, that's a curveball. I hadn't heard that one, Linda. I'm going to look into that one. That would, that would be a, quite a, a turn of events there. Um, so moving on. We have Goliath, we've got this giant who's realistically carrying around several hundred pounds of bronze that he calls armor. 
Um, and I did look it up. There's nothing actually mentioned about his sword, um, but just as a, a bit of curiosity, um, a typical sword for Philistines back then would have been, again, made out of bronze, but no longer than about 12 to 18 inches. And given his stature being, I guess we could say double of everyone else, his, his sword would have been about a 36 inch sword, which would have had considerable weight to it as well. Was it a sword or a spear? It was, he had a spear. His sword is not yeah. meant, er, his sword is only mentioned in the end where David cuts his head off. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't like a, um, uh, like this five foot long Braveheart sword. So it's it's yes. mentioned. It's mentioned again yes. because yes. David, David gets it. David gets the mm -hmm. the sword is apparently stored at the at the temple or yes. in some place there. Yeah. And David ends up with it, mm -hmm. and uh, so it must not have been so big that he couldn't have handled it. Right. So it had to be something that that, that he that he was able to. Right. But he wasn't a little man either. I mean, he was when he was grown. He was, uh, when he, was very, growing, yes. he was an impressive individual mm -hmm. as well. Right. So, I mean, he, so that sword that he got from the priest was Goliath's sword. Yeah, there's there's no sword like this or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, did I see your hand? Okay, cool. All right, so moving on to David. Um, what, do we, what do we know about him at this time? He's a shepherd boy. Right. He's the younger. He's he's formidable already, mm -hmm. defending the flock. Mm -hmm. He's a true believer in God. Mm -hmm. Had no fear. Right. Um, he's not fully grown, probably, because he could not wear Saul's armor. No, he and so he's the youngest of eight. I have my notes here, um, <clears throat> and again, we're not. Uh, given his exact age, um, but he, from research that I did, was between 12 and 15 wow. years old. So preteen to middle teenager. Um, and yes, as Steve mentioned, he was already fighting off lions and bears to protect the sheep. Um, what was he doing there um, at that particular battle? Why was he there? Well, it says his father was an old man at this point. And I don't know if he sent David or if David just was curious, but he had made several trips back and forth mm -hmm. to see his brothers and to take the provisions yes. while they were on the front line. So that's yes. what prompted this particular visit. And it appears from the chronology that unfolds in Samuel that, that on his previous visits, they were before the Philistines sent. Uh, Goliath on the challenge of Okay. On this particular visit that was in the midst of that 40 day challenge. Yes. yes. Um, and I don't know if this is getting too far ahead, but in the, in the discussion going back and forth to me, uh, second, or 1 Samuel 17 26 sums up David's attitude. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? That kind of reinforces what Steve was saying. Yeah, and, and he never calls him by name. He's always a the state of the uncircumcised Philistine. Right, and that's actually where I was going next. Um, but just it's all yours. Just real quick before we get there, uh, I think you kind of, kind of got, kind of you're dancing around it, but um, so we have the Philistines versus. Um, versus God's people. Um, how did they feel about Goliath? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Saul was even terrified of him. Um, so as Ken just read, uh, verse, I think you read verse 26 and 27? Yeah, just 26. And the people answered him in the same way. Yeah. So shall it be done the man who kills him. So the rewards of Saul go to anybody who can kill Goliath. Yeah, okay. So, the idea that I had is, is David understood God in a way that 
the grown-ups, the, the grown men around him had no clue about. They, 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 they knew God. They knew his word up until that point. They um, knew the commands and so on and so forth, yet they were standing there at the feet of this giant, and they're just shaking in their boots because they were scared. Um, so I feel like David, yeah, David did understand God in a way that those around him, the, the warriors, uh, didn't. Um, can someone read verse... Well, you know what, I'll read it. Um, this is... I'm working through some three-year-old notes here, guys. Bear with me. Um, his oldest brother, um, was he was he happy to see David? Huh? No, he wasn't. So in verse... The thing is also, if you look, David was the shepherd boy. That was the lowest occupation you could have in those days. So he was not look up on him, but down on him. Mm -hmm. And that's by the family and others too. She's just a shepherd's boy. And if you look at God, he worked always with the shepherds. You should have told them something. Mm -hmm. So in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 28, um, now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why have you come down, and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. That's some pretty, those are fighting words, I think. Uh, and David said, What have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way, and the people answered him again as before. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. To Ken's point, he never calls him by name. And Saul said to David, You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used, used to keep sheep. Uh, David talks in the third person a lot here. Um, but David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and when there came a lion or a bear, and I took a lamb from and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him, struck him, and delivered it out of his mouth, and if he rose against me, I caught him by the beard, and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, well, Go, the Lord be with you. Um, I just I find that kind of funny in a way. Because Paul or Saul rather is is sitting there and they're quaking in his sandals. <laughs> right? Uh, and David, this, like, he's a maximum of, of 15 years old, I think. And he, he comes up there and he's talking to King Saul and says, what are you going to do about this guy? And Saul's like, nothing we can do. And so David, this guy has this big teenage energy that I love, and he shows up and he's like, no, nah, I'm going to deal with him like I dealt with the lions that tried to take sheep. And on that note, like you don't the lion and the bear, you said earlier that the other words were fighting words. And David could have let himself get provoked mm -hmm. into confronting his brother and wasting all that energy that mm -hmm. should have been directed at the lion. But he already is demonstrating a fair amount of wisdom in just turning around and walking away from that situation. Mm -hmm. And if you can take out a lion or a bear, Iliad's probably not a huge problem. <laughs> yeah. I, I would tend to agree, and it shows, uh, to your point, it shows uh, wisdom on David's point, um, but it shows a lot of restraint that I've never seen in a teenager. I mean, especially a teenage boy, someone comes up to him and says, why are you here? You're worthless. A 15-year-old boy is going to do something about it, or, or die trying. Uh, 
say, um, yes. Ian, <clears throat> just look in a little bit here. Now, you'd mentioned earlier that perhaps uh, Goliath came from France, Paul, mm -hmm. but it says here Do you have something different? he's from Gath. Gath? Gath? Is that what it is? Gath. I must be some, thinking of something different. So Gath is in the region, mm -hmm. okay, which may make better sense. I heard that the Philistines came from the area of Crete originally, okay, and that they were coastal mm -hmm. people uh, during the land uh, in the time of Ju Judea, uh, or Judah, mm -hmm. and which would be basically the Gaza Strip area today. And so this was an excursion into Judah and uh, to try and defeat the army um, and Israel. Okay. And there's yes. in when the Israelites came into the into Canaan to take start taking it over, there's there's a couple of references to giant people that were in Israel mm -hmm. that uh, uh, that uh, are discussed and in in some cases where uh, I think it was uh, uh, I don't know one of the I can't remember the guy's name now. He, it, he goes into the mountain region and he kills all of the giants. It talks about giants being in Israel. So there were some race of people that that mm -hmm. were that they called giants. Maybe that was okay. the Rephaim. In Canaan, it yeah. was the Rephaim. Okay. And if you look at um, when when that got into Canaan. In Canaan was the Raphaim, and then it says um, the what was it, Caleb and Joshua, Joshua the son of Nun, and the Raphaim said the robber Joshua, the son of of Nun, the robber. So they were in Canaan. Well, when they spied the land out, they came back and yeah. said, said there were giants. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Linda? Well, just another piece of trivia. <laughs> First Samuel 9 2 says that Saul was taller than anybody. Yeah. He was also very tall. In fact, mm -hmm. it says, a handsome young man, there was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than from his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. That was Saul. Well, that's an interesting statement. Yeah. Yeah. Saul was upward. a tall man. Yes. As an Israelite, he was taller than the Israelite. Right, than the yeah. Israelites. Right. Just interesting comparing and contrasting that you have David that goes in here. That's mm -hmm. probably why like Saul stuff in a minute, too. Yeah, well, yeah, he was very young. And, and, and he's deferring when he's bigger than anybody else there. Right, Except yes. Except for Goliath. Yeah. Um, okay, so moving on. Okay, so now we're getting ready to go into battle, and this is a, another thing that. We short people. Uh, what's that? <laughs> oh no, I'm oh. saying we short people. We're saying we short uh, people would be in trouble. <laughs> get a slingshot, you'll be fine. <laughs> <clears throat> um, this is an. I mean, of course, I grew up Catholic, so we didn't ever get the whole story on anything. But um, growing up and and hearing about David and Goliath, we. I just don't ever remember hearing any of this stuff. So now in verse uh, chapter 17, verse 38, um, then let's see here. Okay. So then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them, so David put them off. He took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. Um, so I think that right there shows a lot. That shows more bravery and more courage uh, and, and wisdom as well on David's point. He goes... Uh, towards the Philistine without armor because he couldn't move properly in it, pres presumably. 
Um, it, it was too big, it was cumbersome, and so he took what he knew, which was stones and a sling. And it wasn't like, this is another thing too, um, his sling was a piece of leather. Yeah. It was a loop of, of leather. And so it wasn't like a modern day slingshot with like a nice fine steel ball in there. He was river rocks. Leather. Um, and then this is very... Yes, but if, if we let our imaginations go a little bit, how many hours did David practice with that sling just sitting out there watching sheep with mm -hmm. nothing better to do? Yeah, uh, I, I agree with you. I, I agree 100% with you. He was probably... About, uh, different armies with warriors who could sling a, a, a rock with either hand. Yeah. Uh, so it, it was a, a fairly common weapon that with practice like anything else. They're an effective one. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, in verse 40, uh, 41, and the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. So Goliath is going into this with an entourage against a teenager, which I find That's funny. kind of funny, but also um, he's he kind of shows his weakness there too. He, he needs a team of people, or he has a team of people with him. David is there with himself. Um, and when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. I don't understand that part, but. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with, or come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And then this is where David pipes up and has some pretty choice words. Um, then David said to the Philistine, You come, out, come to me with a sword and with a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defi defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give you the dead, give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all His assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hand. And Have any thoughts on that? They you see, I mean, David gave all the glory to God. Yeah. David said, it's not me, it's God, and you have to fear God, not me. Yeah, you know? and I, I think this drives the point home even further as to the rest of the army, especially Saul, um, who's, yeah, I don't want to deal with this guy, send the kid out, right? <laughs> and David, he doesn't just kind of timidly go into battle. It, I think it says, um, uh, yeah, there it is in the very next verse. It says, when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, what did David do then? Does anyone have that handy? They ran quickly. Yeah, he rushed him. Yeah. He should have been kind of maybe, well, I'll just kind of sneak up on him and yeah. work my way in here a little bit. But Let's no. juke around just a little right. bit. Yeah, no. David, uh, yeah, it says, uh, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. And this is so much more graphic than what we have as a kid. Linda, did you have something? Well, and the comment he made about leaving his body for the birds and the, the beast, I mean, that's a real disgrace. Probably mm -hmm. Sylvia could uh, attest to that more, but in Israel, not having a formal burial like that, that shows that a total disgrace. Yeah, he's a warrior. He's supposed to die in glorious battle against a formidable opponent, and I don't think that was David in his eyes. Um, bad food. Yeah, bad food, that's right. Um, then the end here, the stone sank into his forehead and he fell face to the ground. Must have had. You know, he he obviously 
was good with the sling, with the sling, <laughs> but he knew to stay away from the sword. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so he was he was back far enough away that, that Goliath wasn't a threat at that point, mm -hmm. and so he could he you know he softened up the enemy with the stone and uh, won it in one in one one fell swoop. He yes, it took out the enemy, mm -hmm. but it's a it's a pretty standard approach to battle is to soften up the enemy with the airplanes and the artillery mm -hmm. before you send in the men. Mm -hmm. And that uh, and that's, you know, right, I mean, that's David's thinking. Let's take him out with a stone. Yeah, and he did it in one shot. He doesn't try to fight him, he just says, let's, let's just Let's just do it. Take care of it. And yeah, he did. And he did. And he had some uh, the lack of some sort. Yeah, that's what I was getting to next. He um, he he promised he was going to cut his head off, and being as he didn't have Saul's sword with him, <laughs> he used the closest one at hand. Which I, I think is also wondered, what was the what was the guy that was carrying the shield? What was he doing while all this was going on? As it says that there was a shield bearer out in front of Goliath. Well, like, like I guess maybe. he just he just stayed out of it. Well, yeah. well, he, he well, just, well, well, verse fifty. The end of verse fifty one tells us when the Philistines saw that their champion was, was dead, they fled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they, they stayed out of there by the armor yeah. of the shield bearer. Well, the shield bearer though, is as far as why he wasn't like getting in there to, to help um, uh, Goliath. Throughout the challenge, it was kind of a mano a mano type thing, yeah. and so the shield bearer stayed out of it because I think he was told. Right. 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 So he saw things go down. He headed for the background. Yeah, uh, I think I would. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's the reason David also took some extra stones in case there was somebody else then. Yeah. Challenged him. Yeah, and um, I, I I don't think there was any challenging <laughs> challenging there. Um, well, it, it, it just points out, just like what David says, it was God that did it. Yes, and that was, so, looking at my notes here, uh, I kind of ended these lessons with some questions, and, and we're getting kind of close on time, so let's do that. Um, so, I guess, yeah, I guess I don't have a question there, but it, I think that we can kind of talk about um, the spiritual strength versus the physical strength because David showed up to bring supplies to his brother and he didn't have I mean he had some physical strength I think he was pretty accurate pretty deadly with his sling but he wasn't a big guy by any means um, whereas he showed up and the army that he was bringing supplies to they were big they did have physical strength they had um, knowledge in battle um, but I guess what did they do with it versus what David did with it? They each had different strengths, and I think he used his a lot more wisely than they used their strength. And the yeah. Philistines, their god was Dagon, you know, so they believed in a different god. Mm -hmm. And then seeing what David did and what he proclaimed, I mean, that had to be incredible. Yeah. I don't know if that changed any of them or not, but. Yes. Yeah. Something just occurred to me, unless we can draw from this from the Philistine side of the equation, uh, they had put their trust in Goliath, mm -hmm. not even in Dagon, but in the yeah. of God. And so that's a real warning for us, is don't put your hopes and trust in people. That's right. Because ultimately people are going to let you down one way or another. Yeah. And in this case, Goliath was thoroughly overcome by the power of God. Yes. I, I would agree with that. Um, well, that's, that's kind of all I got. Uh, unless you guys got some. Go ahead, Steve. <clears throat> Just a, a little historical context. So the place that this occurred is described very clearly in Samuel 17, for Samuel. And the place is still there. You can go there. Mm -hmm. You can actually look at the hill where the Philistines were on and the hill where the Israelites were on. And the Valley of Elah, whatever they call it, and the creek bed, and where he picked up those stones, all of it's right there. And it's a field, uh, they call it a valley, 
but it's like a field now mm -hmm. where it, it's being probably farmed, you know. But it's not like full of houses, it's not buried in some city anywhere. Mm -hmm. And to, if you think about it, the stone that actually killed Goliath is probably still laying there somewhere. <laughs> just don't know which one it is, but it's, I mean, why wouldn't it be? It's got to be right there, so. I mean, the Catholic Church hasn't found it? No. Yeah, no. Just give them a little bit time. Yes, <laughs> so I, I watched a video, a video on it. It's very interesting that they decided to work out their differences with the fight from one man to another man. And to me, that's got to be the scariest way to settle an argument yeah. or if your guy loses then you surrender as, a, as an army and why would you ever submit yourself to that just go in and fight to the last man sort of a thing so it was pretty scary when what looked like an undefeatable opponent comes out and says you know let's let's have a fight today mm -hmm. and that went on for I think I read somewhere 40 days but there's some terms there too so it wasn't just like you surrender and it's it's over with. Um, it's uh, if he's able to fight with this is Goliath. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. Right. So there was there was some some more than just a surrender. Yeah, I, and I don't know why you never agree to that and why Saul allowed. <laughs> David to go down there knowing that he is the complete underdog in the situation. But I, I think yep. Saul did know. Well, I wonder Nobody if, will go. Well, you I, know? I wonder if, if Saul's faith was bolstered by David's enough to be like, this guy's got it figured out. Sure, go get it. Or did you know? Oh, you were saying something about the, when it describes him as a ruddy faced boy. Yeah. Yeah. And you, got a, you got a note there? Well, okay. yeah. It Mike says the same Hebrew word is translated dark and very red. Here it emphasizes David's youthfulness and inexperience. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Dark yeah, thank you. So yeah. so little little boy. Yeah. A, but a but a tot. Okay. I think ruddy can also be um, a term used for red hair. Red hair. Well, and see that would dark and very and red. Yeah, very red. I've heard it used that way. Huh. So yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, that's all I got, everyone. It's interesting. About yeah. Okay. So it's kind of a. It's just a, a a little bit different. Well, not a different, but a kind of an original look at at what actually happened because it's. It's a lot more than just a little kid's story. And there's a bunch of them in there like that. So, By the way, the, um, the Philistines took off, so they never became servants mm -hmm. of Israel. Yeah, they didn't hold up their end of the bargain. No. No. They never did. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think they, uh, Saul intended to keep his end of the bargain did. either. <laughs> he didn't yeah. intend, he, he didn't care if David got killed. He wasn't going to surrender. Well, and I, I kind of, yeah, I don't, I don't know what to do with that either because yeah. Saul's kind of, kind of like throwing in the towel there. You know? This is just, this is just something to everybody to watch. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So, but no, it just shows you what, uh, what, what faith can do. Well, and the thing guys, will be because Saul was the king. He had he would have to be at the front of of the army, but he was way back there hiding in tent or whatever it was. And he was the biggest of of the Israelite. It was kind of yeah. yeah. And he lost his faith. Yes. And he was a yes. And that was obvious to him, I think. I think you're right, too. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you.